Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Sacred Space Podcast. My name is Gina Stockton, and oh my word, I'm so excited that you are here, and I'm so excited about my guests, Terry and Nancy Clark. And oh my word, Terry and Nancy have been leading worship since the Jesus Movement. Terry is one of the most prolific songwriters and uh, worship leaders, has a profound testimony, and guys, his voice was a seminal part of the formation of my life as a believer. Um, Terry leading worship was a significant uh, part of my getting to know who Jesus was, learning about his love, learning about worship, learning about his presence. And so the fact that I got to have this conversation with them was just so sweet. Norm and I uh, had the privilege of leading with them a lot back in the 90s. We got to back them up and be a part of different things that were just incredible. So I really hope you enjoy this episode, that you recognize that these are giants in the faith. These are uh, mother, father, grandmother, grandfather in the faith who have just been walking that life of faith with Jesus, have been completely surrendered and obedient to him. And I really hope you glean from their wisdom, from their story, from Terry's story. And uh, I hope that you enjoy your time in the sacred space. Terry and Nancy Clark, welcome. Mm. Thank I'm you. so excited that you're here and we that I'm too. looking. I, I've been telling Norma, like, Terry and Nancy are coming. <laughs> Terry and, and goes, Nancy no are coming. Deal. He's like, <laughs> so, every, yeah. so what? Yeah, so uh, I'm leaving town. <laughs> so good. So I have to, I've been sharing the story with people when I've been telling them this week that you were coming. So I met you, Terry, for the first time in 1987. Um, I was 18 years old, and there was a mission trip to Scotland with Horizon. Oh, yes. yes. I had just recently kind of come back to church. I mm. got saved at the end of the Jesus Movement when I was 12 mm. in Old North mm-hmm. Park Theater mm. before Horizon was called Horizon. Right. You know, John and Lisa Wickham were leading worship mm-hmm. and stuff. And then high school, senior year, I was just busy and mm-hmm. doing all the things and eventually just yeah. wasn't going to church. I wasn't, like, walking away from Jesus. I just... It yeah. just, yeah, it, it was the less important thing in my life. And then yeah. the Lord brought me back when Horizon moved to Claremont and, yeah, you know, yeah. stuff was happening. So 87 was when I was kind of back. They announced that trip, which is a huge miracle that I went because I was super insecure and kind of uh-huh. socially scared and mm-hmm. would never go places without friends. And I, I took this weird risk to go on this <laughs> trip. I didn't know anybody. It was perfect medicine and, for that problem. <laughs> yeah. And... This is a time when Horizon was big. Thousands, I mean, tons of services. Mm-hmm. Like whoever is leading worship, speaking, you're you have no relationship with those people mm-hmm. other than this, just the connection spiritually. So you, of course, Terry and Nancy, you guys were a big deal <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> it was like Terry Clark, you know, and I, you know, as a young eighteen year old, like they're so spiritual. Terry oh, is my. such a spirit because you're so anointed. Like God would just do mm-hmm. crazy stuff t- through your worship, and I get on the plane. To go to Scotland by myself, I'm totally nervous, and I walk down the aisle, and I I look at the row, and I look, and I look down, and who am I sitting next to but Terry Clark? <laughs> and everything in me was like, oh my gosh, I'm sitting next to Terry Clark. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. Okay, you know. <laughs> and then it wasn't until the end of the plane ride before you found yeah. out. Nah, it's a piece of cake. She moved right after that. <laughs> Nine hours. I need to. I'm oh gonna my. sit next to it. But it was awesome. You were the sweetest, most kind, oh. loving man. And you just. Did you bring money to pay her? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you just took me under your wing. I think um, your daughters and I are similar age. So yes. you just kind of like, you're here on your own. You're, I'm going to take care oh of you, my, you know? That's great. And um, that trip was the beginning of a lot of things for me. I met Chuck Butler on that trip, who was the worship pastor, mm-hmm. another person yes. that I never thought I would meet. And I sat next to you on the plane. I sat next to him on the bus to the dorms where we were staying, and Mm -hmm. he invited me to join the worship team for the trip. I had never really done, been a part of a worship team before, and Mm -hmm. I came back, and that that began my journey with Jesus, you know, Mm -hmm. in ministry and stuff. And it's interesting, I I did a podcast with uh, Karen and Mickey Stonier. Oh, cool. Uh, Oh, yeah, we heard bits of that. Yeah, and they were talking a lot about 
your identity, how seeing so many believers in the mm-hmm. church, their identity being so tied in what they do for yes. the Lord. Yeah. And that was true for me in a lot of ways, not because I felt so great for singing, but I was such an orphan mm. that mm. that was where I, that mm. was kind of my, it became my new home yes. and being a part of the worship ministry was like, yes. though, this is the nice little thing I can, I can do this. Yes. I mm-hmm. can't do much, but I can do this. Is mm-hmm. this okay? Mm-hmm. Can I stay now? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that kind of became my, yeah, yeah, that became my purpose was to be in this community and be mm-hmm. with these people. And now I can actually serve and do something Beautiful. that maybe Jesus would like, <laughs> which is a good thing and powerful thing. And God used it in really powerful ways but then those are the things that i had to deconstruct and reconstruct right. later he was he was building he the was, identity that he, he was he building wanted. and you know i remember when um when my first daughter was born and you know the horizon praise band that we were part of you know roy god called him to another church and different mm-hmm. things were happening and then i had mm-hmm. kids and god was moving norman and the lord kind of pulled me back mm-hmm. And he just was like, Gina, I don't need your gift. I want you. Mm. You know, that, Amen. that like, yes. it's, it's, it's okay. I love you. Just like with oh. the spit up on your shoulder and mm-hmm. not feeling like you're a good mom. I, mm-hmm. said, I love you just the same, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. So it was quite so. the journey, but, um, I'm just blabbing like crazy. It's wonderful. You're my guest. I would love for you guys <laughs> to <guest>. share. <laughs> it's a mutual thing. So you know? anyhow, all that to say is I love you guys a lot. And um, Ditto. it's a huge Ditto. honor to have you there here. So yeah, I would love for my listeners to hear from you, to hear who you are, hmm. a little bit of your story, I think what it's you do. and Better if you keep telling your listeners yeah. who we are. You sound much better yeah. at it than we would. You probably can make money doing that. <laughs> well, I, I, I just want to say that that Scotland trip was a very pivotal trip in so many directions. Yeah. So many directions because Mike Mack and I, we, we were standing on the top floor of Corrobor's close mission up, up on the top looking down High Street mm. and we both almost broke down weeping hmm. because right across the street, almost straight across the street, just down a little bit, was the cathedral that was on fire with the Holy Spirit hmm. at one time in the history of that town, that yeah. city. And it, it was just blazing. The lights were on hmm. all night with people worshiping the Lord and great Careful. preaching. Mm-hmm historic stuff i mean and and yeah. corrubbers is right next door to john knox's house wow one of the you know the, the iconic names from back then but um we almost wept because the color was all gone yeah and we both it broke our hearts yeah and we went why why does this happen and we both know scripture well enough to know that it wasn't passed on to the next generation. Hmm. Like you said, it's the identity becomes what you do mm-hmm. after you do it for a while and you're successful especially. And so that, that same cycle happens as the Lord moves, as the Holy Spirit comes and transforms a, a city or, or a nation or a home or, or, or a person. We have to keep our eyes on the Lord. If we don't, we drift. And yeah. So it's a, it's a spiritual pressure that's on during these cycles that, that we go through. And I think it's parental. Mm-hmm. It's cycles of bearing a child and yeah. being a parent and yeah, well, and then it, the results and, and the I, consequences. I would even say it's, it's, it's not even just biological parental, it's spiritual parental because there's, oh, yeah. you know, it's interesting that that cyclical kind of history of the church. I remember back in the 90s, Woody Wirt, Dr. Wirt, would teach at the School of Evangelism. Oh, boy. And I was in there one. I I didn't attend School of Evangelism. uh, School of Evangelism was like a ministry Mm -hmm. um, school just for those who are listening and don't know what it is. It was a ministry school connected to Horizon Christian Fellowship, which is a Calvary Chapel. And this was back in the um, probably early 90s. And uh, my friend Bridget Mm-hmm. was going and I went with her one day and Dr. Wirt who just a 
amazing man of <laughs> yes. God who worked for Billy Graham and edited Citizen Magazine, and he was in his 90s at this point. Yeah, and still whitewater still, rafting. Still, yeah, climbing <laughs> mountains and whatnot. And uh, he taught in the class, and he was he started talking about the cyclical nature of the church and how, you know, starting with the early church, these, these starting in Acts, you know, these, these powerful supernatural moves of God would have to come in and bulldoze these constructs that man had made, where they've yes. taken the, the heart of God, the mode of God, that just turned religious, it's the pharisaical mindset, it's those things. Mm-hmm. Um, and that supernatural move has to come in and, and push through That's and right. tear down the strongholds. Yes. And, and, and Isaiah 61, right? Open mm-hmm. the prison doors, set the captives mm-hmm. free, bring oil of joy for mm-hmm. mourning, beauty for ashes, etc. And um, he said, but eventually that, that wave is going to recede. Mm-hmm. And man is going to pre- try to perpetuate that in their own strength, and then there, right. it, those solidifications are going to happen again, and a new, a new move is going to have to happen, yes. and that's what the Jesus movement was. And he said, mm-hmm. "Mark my words, right. the same thing is going to happen to Calvaries, yes. <laughs> and everyone in the room, <gasps> you know, yeah. how dare you?" And he's yeah. like, "No, I'm not. This right. isn't an accusation. This no, is it's reality. This is look at the Old Testament. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> look at you know Israel. This is the way, this is, this is the way we do things. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And you know, to that ringing of the bell that you said, you know, I mean, this last year has been oh, just boy. that. It's been a grand disruption, and especially for our Western evangelical right. church and what it's become and the, mm-hmm. the the organizations and the institutions and the programs and the things that we've made of it. And again, this isn't an accusation. This is, these are the cultures we build, mm-hmm. you know. That's right. Um, but and those you... things are being disrupted. And in that disruption, there's a choice, right? right. right. There's a choice to reorient ourselves on him or to st- place blame and look everywhere else and yeah it's a it's an interesting place and there is a huge divide a lot of kids that were raised in the church that are questioning and absolutely and 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 a lot of reason why they're questioning is because they're going this doesn't make like all of this is stupid (laughs) you know and so some of their questions are good questions and should cause the parents and the grandparents in the faith to examine and re-examine what is it that we've been building Mm -hmm. without shaking going on yeah Mm -hmm. we're not gonna uh want to get to the center yeah and what is our stability Mm -hmm. and foundation and that's the grace of god that he shakes things that will shake yeah you know everything will be shaken that can be shaken he says yeah and the reason he does that is that he loves us everything's because i love you and that's that's been uh, piercing our hearts and our dev- own devotions lately. The phenomenal library of God's l- love that we, we've we hardly scratched the surface. Yeah. But if we would do more scratching, <laughs> yeah. then we wouldn't worry about a single thing. We mm. wouldn't be crushed by a single thing. It changes everything because it's the breeding of faith. Yeah. When we see God's love and we actually practically experiment with it and mm-hmm. and discover it. And here, here's what I was thinking while you and I were talking about the, the cyclical thing. He brings a move that transforms everything that's going on, like mm-hmm. the Jesus movement did. But he's done that through history. Yeah. And a lot of things more seismic than the Jesus movement. Absolutely. Really. And... The other part of it is a very, very personal thing. It doesn't happen by mass. It has to become a personal seismic event yeah. for it to stay because then it can be passed on. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just an event in your life. It can't stay in the organizational yeah. box. No, it can't. Then. No. Because it's all based in, in this love that we can't even quantify and therefore we can't understand it because yeah. we're human. We can't grip it and analyze it. We just have to receive it. Yeah. You have to get rid of the idea that you've got to understand everything before you yeah. believe it. Yeah. You know, I loved, I, I didn't know this about Mickey and Karen, but I love the fact that both of them independently came to Jesus on their own by themselves reading the Bible. Well, mm-hmm. I didn't and, know that either. Uh, yeah. And... I love that because yes. we so, um, I think we've lost 
the understanding of the power of God's yes. word. I, and I'm not talking about knowledge, no. you know, no. just knowledge, because it, it isn't no. just about knowledge. It's not just, I mean, the, the enemy knows the word power. better than you and I do. He, he knows it upside mm-hmm. down, inside out, everything like that. But there's something profound and significant about God's word and about his spirit. <laughs> and, and he's a pursuer. I feel like a broken record. There's certain things I say all the time on this podcast, but he is a relentless pursuer and he's fully, like you said, motivated by love and Mm -hmm. his, his word is covered and saturated in that love. That's right. And it has the power to transform Mm -hmm. and to bring healing and freedom. I would love for you to share your story. I feel like we're in a season two where you don't hear people just share their testimony. Like, how did you come to know Jesus? Like, what is that story? If you guys are open to share, I would love for you to share. And I think that that's right in line with my conversations for Terry Clark and Friends, because first of all, about the moat that is between, in the church, the pulpit and the people. Mm -hmm. And in Christian music, the celebrity and the listener. Mm-hmm. That picture, he, he made it so clear to me. Mm. And then he said, that's what I want to bridge. And here's how we're going to do it. Mm. You're going to ask them about the conversations that they had with me that turned each of the corners in their life that brought them where they are now. Yeah. And you're saying the same thing. Exactly. I mean, that was the woman at the well, right? She right. she had a conversation. She had a conversation, an intimate conversation That's right. with Jesus. Yeah. And he very easily could have gone to the next town and, and preached the gospel and hundreds would have come to him. But instead, he, he had a conversation. Yeah. And yeah. then she ran and told her story yeah. and brought people to him. And the beautiful thing about that is that he planned the whole thing. Yeah. Because he loved that lady. Yeah, it's powerful. And he never, he never gives up. Yeah. Or I wouldn't be sitting here. Yeah. And he loves hardheads. <laughs> yeah. So tell us about I'm that. Proof. Let's, I'm proof. Let's hear it. Well, I grew up in a very godly home with generations. <laughs> and on my mom's side, my dad's side, they weren't churched at all. And he had to become a Christian to date my mom. And he did. And he was a fine man, one of the greatest men I've ever ever knew and realized that after he he graduated hmm. but the fact is that I grew up in that in very godly environments he either would hear the message lying on the pew or mm-hmm. under the pew yeah. or it it all went in and uh, when I got to be early teens I was part of the kind of the fabric we were connected with all the original the pioneers of the movement and uh, I wound up at one of their district councils I think I snuck into the balcony of this big conference center and they were having their district council and their business meeting on the floor and I put my elbows on the bar and I listened to what they were doing and at 13 I knew that's not what I'm going to grow up to be Hmm. because they were bickering over the silliest things. Hmm. It was just so obvious that I walked out of that place, and it was my determination to find out what what really I'm supposed to be and hmm. what the world's all about, and I'm going to get an education on everything. And I did that, and then at the end of the trail, then I wound up in the Army. And, of course, you couldn't find a Christian at all when I was there, and it was pre-Vietnam, and uh, I was drafted, and by the fourth or fifth deployment that I went through, which finally ended me up in Germany, I Mm. wound up in the psych ward Wow! with no hope, and they were going to send me back to the U.S. to a VA hospital, probably in Fort Worth, since that's where I reported for the draft. The day before, actually it was the night before they took me and put me in in the hospital, I had gone to my dining room table in the dark in the little 13th century apartment that I was living in outside of Munich and um, piled everything that that had Terry Clark ID on it on the dining room table and searched through all of it to see if there was a piece of justifying evidence that I 
should stick with this human race thing. Hmm. I couldn't find one. Hmm. And by that time, I had already been in Southeast Asia and other countries. Japan was one of them, and I loved that. And so that night, not finding any good reason to be a human being, I just stepped across a little white picket fence into Nana land. Hmm. And I thought I was well. I didn't think I was sick. I thought I was free. For the first time, I was free from all the, all the puppet strings that had controlled my life since I was a little kid. You know, I have to perform to be what I'm supposed to be. And, and so you get that free, and they, they come and take you away. So what did that look like when you say you stepped across the white picket fence in the La La Land? That's exactly what it looked like to me. Because yeah. I was saying, no, I don't belong here. Yeah. I'm, I'm out. I'm out of here. I'm yeah. not going to play these games anymore. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of a mental picture mm-hmm. of seeing the picket fence, but it was just the border yeah. of all of those things enclosed in this little corral that I was living in and stepping out of it yeah. was suddenly available to me hmm. and had real purpose. And so I did that. When they came and got me the next morning and took me to the psych ward, I, I just went through the the hoops that they take you through. Yeah, what made them come get you? Did because I was, I was call? free to say anything I, uh, that yeah. I saw. It was a lot more complicated than that, obviously, but um, they wrote on the hospital report that I wasn't violent. dangerous yeah. or violent mm-hmm. or anything. They were very well-mannered, in fact. and but just The yeah. psychosis was too deep. For yeah. them to, to fix. And yeah, they, were, they knew knew my past. and They were going to transport him to the United States to a VA hospital. And, and uh, they had already seen probably thousands by the time I got there. Yeah. Go through the same reactions to all of that. And then one day I pulled my old black Bible out of my duffel bag from under the bed. And I propped myself up in the bed and opened it up and started reading. And... Um, The days before had been filled with a lot of probably more drugs than I ever took on the outside. Hmm. They used military to uh, experiment on. They experiment, especially on the psychosis and the schizophrenic drugs and all that. That's who they used to experiment on. And they had, I was taking 21 pills three times a day. Wow. Pastel colored, nice, pretty, pretty ones, but a lot, a lot of stuff that day prop myself up and suddenly I hear my childhood friend's voice and it's Jesus of course and I I had no debate about it and he just said Terry I know how you feel Hmm. I've seen everything human beings have ever done Hmm. I mean you think you saw everything and have been part of more than you want to admit but I've seen everything and I'm here to let you know that there's another way to think about this and You've decided not to be a human being. And for the same reason, and for a whole lot more evidence, I chose to become one. And then he drowned, literally drowned me, drowned me in how he feels toward human beings. Hmm. It's a passion, a love. It was the lethal dose of of a passion I, I couldn't even express. One interesting thing that was going on that I didn't know at the time was that my mom got this call from her friend that had been a friend for a long time in Corpus Christi. And this lady, who was a scary godly woman, called her and said, the Lord just gave me a vision of Terry in the hospital bed. Mm -hmm. And there is a furnace of fire underneath him. And I can hear the devil's voice going, I don't have to worry about this one anymore. Mm -hmm. But she said, but he's in a cocoon. Mm -hmm protected from the flames. And, of course, she didn't hear the conversation that was going on yeah. on the inside of that cocoon. Yeah. But that's when the Lord was speaking, baptizing me. And, uh, mm. and he actually he gave you a, a brand new mind. Yeah, he actually asked me what I wanted to do. He said, now, what do you want to do, Terry? Hmm. It's up to you. And I said, well, that's the only rational reason to be a human being I've heard. <laughs> so... I went back in. (laughs) That's good. And so he basically, you know, swept aside all the ashes of the burnt brain matter and put a brand new one in my head. (laughs) Things started happening pretty fast (laughs) physically because of the new mind 
and it was so quick that every every half hour the nurses and the assistants and the doctors were coming in with that rubber hammer that they use <laughs> yeah. to check your the reflexes reflexes they would beat me up with that and <laughs> he would scratch out the dosage for the next thing and wow. those 21 pills three times a day started to dwindle pretty fast because every half hour they were just cutting it in half it shows well, you how powerful that those drugs were that they were giving yeah, people. Yeah, how crazy too because that would normally be pretty dangerous too to come off so fast you know yeah, so absolutely the the miracle is right. is the healing but also that god protected you mm-hmm. in absolutely. getting all of that crap out of your system and every time i tell this you know in a, brutal medications. Yeah, every time I tell this in a concert or a, a service of some kind, there's always a psychologist that comes to me very compassionately and says, we've got better drugs now. <laughs> well, I should hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that, but I got the best of all. I know, right? Because uh, Jesus gave me a brand new mind, and your pills yeah. can't do that for me. Yeah. But... Um, <laughs> But the thing is that I was making this transition physically because of the new, the control center was brand new. Mm -hmm. And your mind tells your body what to do. And so it's trying to bring me back to normalcy, how it would function. And in the evening, the nurse was one I hadn't seen during this, these days that I had been in there. And it was a night nurse that had been off for vacation. She evidently looked at the night before charts, saw the 21 pills, and she got her cart and, and gathered her the 21 pill, pills <laughs> pill, pill cups for her rounds, and she started making her rounds, and she brought them to me. And I thought, well, I, I mean, I didn't question it because right. she's the nurse, right? Yeah. And I don't want to get hit by a nurse, you know, knocked <laughs> out just because I won't take the pills. So I took the pills. That's when I pulled the Bible out from under the bed, out of my duffel bag. I sat there and was opening the Bible. And as I read, my face began to twitch. Mm. And I was going, wait a minute, this is not the Holy Spirit. Mm. I realized that when I started to try to move, I was really stiff. But I swiveled off of my bed and headed toward the nurse's station. I turned the corner and she looked up at me and she grabbed the phone because she knew exactly what she had done. Oh, man. And I don't remember how long it was, but when the doctor showed up, it was like it was like a cartoon because he had this white thing and it was his cape. He was flying through the... <laughs> I mean, he was coming down the hall and that thing... His, his coat. His coat, his white coat, you know, like a big wing behind him. And he had the biggest needle I've ever seen in my life in his hand and he was wasn't holding it next to him he was aiming it where oh he gosh. was going oh my gosh. and he no didn't w- wipe it with alcohol or anything mm. just the first place he could get that needle in me he jammed it in me and did the plunger and that was really the miracle that you're talking about because i found out after what the reaction is to those drugs being overdosed. And what it was doing was reacting in my muscle tissue and then the softer tissue, and it clenched the muscle. That's not the right word, but... It's like a spasm. Until it crystallizes. Mm -hmm. And then you're a rock. If your brain survives, it's a rock with a brain in it. But that didn't happen because he got there with that needle Mm -hmm. right on time. Anyway, ever since... Well, they did have to do a re-diagnosis before he yeah, was dismissed he changed from the, the hospital. Yeah, No Hope will arrange to have him sent back to the States. It said, in that same line on the form, it said, recovering satisfactorily. Wow, that's crazy. I still am <laughs> recovering satisfactorily. Thank you. Not you know, quite there, but... <laughs> not quite there, but... I will know. be... Soon and very soon. But because of that instance, uh, Jesus just moved in to be his sole sanity. Yeah. For my only sanity. Right. There was no other reasoning with other people about things. He went to Jesus, which is what the Lord wants from all of us. Yeah. For a solid year, it was like um, whatever was going on was completely foreign to me. Someone would say something and I would go, 
am I supposed to answer that? What am I supposed to say? Hmm. But that was the constant thing because he was repopulating my experience with the conversation I would have to have with him to have the sanity to live in this world. Yeah, so can you say that again? Because our listeners can't see you looking up. So you're saying for that first year... You were dependent on Jesus for everything. Yeah, every everything was completely foreign to me, like being on a different planet. Hmm. And I like I like the I way had no you'd said before that you threw everything that was Terry Clark into the trash. Well, at this point, now you're taking things out, and one by one, what about this? Either throwing it back in the trash or, or putting it in the file yeah. in my brain to operate what I am and who I am. And it's still that way. Mm-hmm. Because this world is not my home. Yeah, my home is Jesus, and He's my only sanity. And Nancy knows it's a thin line, <laughs> uh, but I'm sure she counts on the fact that I'm going to turn, and look at Jesus, mm-hmm. and even though my own reflexes or reactions or something would take over for a second or two, it's going to be His point of view that would get engaged or you know it's so interesting because it's it's just dependence right yes and you because of that circumstance you know so jesus is a redeemer right that's 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 who he is that's his was it his will that you go through all this trauma and everything I would not say it was his will that like he sent you all that, but you chose to go, I'm not going to walk away. I'm going to go figure this out on my own. You get drafted. You're in the middle of all this stuff, but his pursuit and his mm-hmm. love for you is going to meet mm-hmm. you there. But the beauty of redemption is that those things that the enemy meant to destroy you, yes. he's turned around and he's created those as the vehicle to bring you into that dependence with him, which exactly. most people don't recognize and aren't able to go to, but you, because of what you went through, have to be in this place of dependence, which is what we're all called to, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. That being with him, that John 17, Mm -hmm. and, you know, I only do what I see my father doing, you know, that is that, okay, what are we doing today, Lord? Should Mm -hmm. I go here? Should I? (laughs) Are we, are we good? Okay, good. You know, and that's, you know, that's a, what a precious gift. And this really bounces yes. back from what we were talking about to begin with, that organizations and churches and, and everything that's going on as normal, they get in a cycle of this is how we do things, this is what we know to do, and it's really running on its own steam and not yeah. really depending yep. on the freshness of the Holy Spirit and the yeah. wisdom that He wants to bring mm-hmm. to people's lives. And so what has to happen? There has to be the shaken up that we were talking yeah. about. There has to be changes and transformations. Yeah. And we will not choose that. Yeah. So God has to, in His mercy, yeah. allow us to come to the end of ourselves yep. so that we can be transformed. We can look up. We can say, yes, Lord, you are. Yeah. Our only sanity. So good. And the most beautiful thing that I can think of that that permeates this for me is that, okay, he's God. (laughs) He created me, created the world and everything in it. And he orders everything for our good. Mm -hmm. He orchestrates everything, not just for our good, but for his people's good. Mm -hmm. Those that love him. Yeah. That's a that's a multiplication that's happening. Yeah, it's never through, just about through podcasts us, and, right? No. No, <laughs> you know? because it's affected. It's not something I would make ads out of, but you know, it can be 5 to 15 years after some seismic thing that happened in somebody we don't know and right. suddenly we get a call or a letter or an email yeah. that says I have to tell you. Mhm about what happened to me mm-hmm. yeah. when I heard this song or that or heard you talking or and Jesus just transformed me. Mm-hmm. And of course it's not my doing, but it's me out of the way, isn't it? Yeah. And I I pray that that continues to to mm-hmm. be the case that I can stay out of the way, yeah. But be vocal enough to do what He puts in my hand to do, yeah. And know that He's orchestrating it for somebody, 
Yeah. And even this podcast is going to be orchestrated for somebody. Yeah. And I did a, a Terry Clark and Friends episode with Kelly Willard. Hmm. And, I mean, she, she's been through a lot so of much, yeah. stuff. Just her brokenness and her humbleness before the Lord and her desire to please Him uh, that comes out so clearly yeah. in everything, it's bound to pull down barriers that, yeah. that are a wall around us once we build that wall. Yeah. And um, I was looking at something this morning that was said by uh, Marcus Rainsford, who's in the 1800s. He wrote an ex- expository book about John 17. Hmm. And the title of the book is The Lord Prays for His Own. Yeah. And, um, and in that, he starts to get into the scope of God's love Mm -hmm. and that he saves us. He brings us into relationship and commitment to the Lord Jesus to connect us to him. Yeah. So we become one and he prays that we would become perfect in one. Yeah. Which that's language is, we can't understand that way of saying it, but there's something in it that connects and it says that, Okay, now you're his. Yeah. Now you're one with him. You're in him. Mm-hmm. Because Christ has, has drawn you to the Father. He is, God the Father is a wall of fire around you mm-hmm. that will not let yeah. the enemy touch you. Mm. And Thank you, Lord. Jesus is the portal, the channel yeah. through which... You're able to enter in and it's have this width. intimacy yeah. with the Father. Yeah. And then the Holy Spirit is the communicator of yep. all this stuff to you and speaks your language. And even when you've lost your brain, yeah. he's there to be Jesus' voice mm. that you recognize because you grew up with him. Yeah, and you, good. I would run to an old plank altar back when they had them. <laughs> and I know I wasn't very big. Because all I remember is lifting my elbows and leaning and saying, Jesus, make me what you want me to be. Mm. I didn't know what a factory you'd have to build to do that. But I'm so glad he did. And I know he's ready to do that for anybody. Yes, it's good. Anybody. It's good. If you'll do it for a hard head like me, Mm -hmm. it's bound to be ready to do it for you, whoever's listening. Well, and I, I also think that something so powerful and encouraging about your story is that you you grew up in a home you knew jesus but there was a point you know like you said you were leaning over the banister seeing these people bickering seeing these people who were supposedly representing jesus and that relationship and you're just like i don't want a part of it and you walked away and you walked away from god but god didn't walk away from you Mm -mm. and there's a lot of a lot of kids. There's a whole generation right now that have done just that. There's a whole generation right now that have looked at what the church has become. They grew up in church. Mm-hmm. They've been hurt. They've been offended. They've been told they have to behave a certain way. Right. It's it's about doing. It's not about being with. It's about doing for, mm-hmm. so that maybe Jesus will love you mm-hmm. enough. Yes, yeah, mm-hmm. right. And what I love about your story is. That there is nothing new under the sun, right? There is that, like, yeah. we all wrestle, we mm-hmm. all walk through this journey mm-hmm. of, we are all created to have this relationship with God, yes. and He is a pursuer, yeah, and yeah. His pursuit started mm-hmm. before time, and it continued in the garden, it continued at the fall, and it continues to this day, yes. and that that Jesus, like you were saying, he is he is the pathway he to the Father. The whole point was reconciliation into intimacy. That's right. Jesus' whole life was a demonstration of living in connected intimacy with the right. Father. Yes. The fruit of that is how you live your life and what you do. But the point of it mm-hmm. was relationship. The mm-hmm. point of Jesus dying on the cross was that not one drop was wasted and mm-hmm. that veil was torn. 
so that we can come boldly. And so we can live out his prayer yes. in John 17, mm-hmm. so that we can live out Matthew 11 and uh, that easy yoke of come with me. Right. You know, I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting right. on you, it says in the message. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. That's right. And I think that's the grand I don't, the word deception is heavy, but the grand lie mm-hmm. that I think so many believers fall right. into is yeah. is feeling like they're on the outside, yes. feeling like they're constantly trying to work mm-hmm. for approval mm-hmm. and kind of just camping mm-hmm. out at the foot of the cross mm-hmm. in shame rather than receiving the gift mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. walking through the veil mm-hmm. and let, you know, being Psalm 91 in the shelter mm-hmm. of the Almighty, abiding under the shelter right. yeah. of His wings in that place of dependence and love and your testimony and your story and how you live your life now is that, is a demonstration of that, is a demonstration yes. of being in that place where it felt like, you know, you need to do four, well, I don't want to do what these guys are doing, right. and then going through such horrible stuff, but then being reconnected and mm-hmm. reunited, but in a way now that you see and you recognize there's mm-hmm. no place I'd rather be. Exactly. No, you no know? it's your only home then. Yeah. And uh, the picture that you've drawn there is so clear and so prevalent. We know young people that have seen the hypocrisy or the self-assertion or the self-obsession of people that call themselves Christians and then been hurt by those people that are so hard now. Yeah. That are so hard. And um, our hearts break for people that are close to us that have gone through that. And the enemy will use that to try to tell me that there's nothing you can do. Right. There's yeah. nothing you can do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and I just look him in the eye and I go, yeah, you're right. There's yeah. nothing I can do, but look at what Jesus has done. Mm-hmm. He can do it. Yeah. And, and for he, them too. Like you said, he won't stop pursuing. Yeah. And our part stop. in the praying department Mm-hmm. is just participating with him. It's not yeah. changing his you know, ability to go and capture that one that's gone astray. Mm-hmm. It is simply participating with him while yeah. he goes and does it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, because it's all an invitation, right? Mm-hmm. He's already right. interceding on our behalf. Right. He right. does, that's the craziest thing to me. He doesn't need me to pray for, no. but he, but he is inviting yes. us. He's yes. like, you know, come here. Right. The analogy I've used before is it's like a four-year-old and his dad goes to Ikea and brings something back to build. And the four-year-old <laughs> right. is helping in yeah. air quotes, you know, but, yeah, but that's that the kind of thing. It's, it's like, it's, exactly right. it's the invitation. Yeah. It's like, I don't. I don't need you here, but I want you here. Right. I want you yeah. to come join me. I yes. want you to do this with me yeah. so that we can do this together, that you are, you know, I'm seated in heavenly places far above right. all right. principality, power, and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, and you're with me. Yeah. Paul yeah. talks about that very same thing, too, in a, in a scripture that I love. I, I believe it's the end of the first chapter of Second Corinthians where Paul's talking about desiring that many would pray with him yeah. on this, as we go through this, as I'm encountering these mm. tribulations, etc., so that there'll be many more giving praise to God mm-hmm. That's good. as yes, a result amen. of the answers. Yeah. And the Lord has shown us that it doesn't matter what we're doing. He'll just bring somebody to our mind. And he has made it very clear that when I do that, I'm saying, come here. Yeah, it's good. Come into my prayer closet with mm-hmm. me because these precious lives and these souls or what we're praying for right now, what yeah. we're interceding for, join me. Yeah, so and good. That. And so what a privilege. What a privilege. I love the one of my favorite verses, Thessalonians verse, and I forget which exact chapter and verse, but it's the rejoice always, pray without ceasing mm-hmm. and everything, give thanks, do not mm-hmm. quench the spirit, do not, you know. It, yeah. um, and, you know, it's one of those verses that I. it's so easy for us to go rejoice, always pray without, okay, that's for, you know, mm-hmm. a monk, yeah, right, right. someone, <laughs> a nun, you know. People. But but that's that's the thing, it's, it's that invitation. It's not this rote, no. uh, vain repetition oh, yes. prayer. Yes. It's it's communion. Right. It's right. It's never breaking. It's Je- again, it's Jesus' Lord. life on earth with the Father. It's constantly being aware that He is with you, and He's constantly yeah. moving and yeah. speaking. And so, then that's one of my favorite things to help people to discover that He's already speaking to you. Yeah. 
now can, how can you posture yourself to listen yes. and to be aware there mm-hmm. you go. Mm-hmm. and not pay attention. There's so many things that I guarantee you six times a day, you'd something fl- flits sure. through your mind and you just kind of push it away. But what would happen if you stopped and went, yeah. Oh, maybe I'll text so-and-so yeah. or maybe mm-hmm. I'm going to pray yeah. for that. Or, and it's so sweet mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. when you start to discover then you start to recognize his voice, right? Right. You start to just, it's being familiar, being in relationship with someone. You know, having proximity with someone is very different than being with someone. Mm-hmm. Yes. Sitting next to someone is very different than being in their presence. I can be in their presence, mm-hmm. but not actually be in their presence. Sure. That's right. And that's the, that's the difference. Like, yes. how do we learn yes. to be in his presence yes. and to mm-hmm. see him and to hear him and to join him and to laugh yeah. with him and to... Yes. You know, yeah, go on the adventure like with him. And nothing, that's nothing like that's that. the, the beauty. That's the beauty. So, Nancy. Uh-oh. Yeah, you've been chiming in and helping Terry <laughs> right. keep on track yeah. telling his story. But Well, it's because I've heard it so much that I could tell it better now than he can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but what do you want to share about your journey in the middle of all this and the partnership? You know, it's interesting. I, Norm and I did a, the beginning of this season, I think, or no, last season. We did... A couple of episodes about partnership and marriage Mm -hmm. and the significance of calling and Mm. believers recognizing the fact that you are something together that you are not apart. Amen. And that the call on Terry's life is not just the call on Terry's Mm -hmm. life, it's the call on both of your lives. The call on your life, Nancy, is not just the call on your life, it's the call on both of your lives. And it's the two of you saying yes to that call. And then in that unified place with Jesus, then whatever the enemy brings against you, it just doesn't have room because you have, you're choosing, Mm -hmm. you're choosing to say yes to that call and whatever that looks like, well, the the sacrifices that are going to be required, the lifestyle that is going to be a part of it, the, Mm -hmm. all of it. And which is the definition of love. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Yeah. You choose. Mm Mm-hmm. You do choose. And it's such so, an ongoing process that you don't really ever arrive to where you're managing adequately. It's yeah. always... It's always it's being always, challenged. Yes, and... Um, by, by the enemy and by... And just recognizing... Distractions that... That if we do not put into place, into practice, those foundations, then the rest of the day, the rest of the week, month, year is just not working as the Lord intended to work. And those foundations have to begin in the morning, casting all our cares upon Him, submitting to His Lordship. Being immersed in His Word. Yeah, we've been been married so long now, I can't imagine it ever having, you know, a different kind of lifestyle, a different focus. It's always been this way. It's, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Being called by the Lord is one of those untalked about truths really you don't debate about it you just you, you start in a certain way of, of life and the lord initiates something to happen you don't stop and scrutinize it you you just are in the moment Mer- and it continues it to grow and this is what life is and then you really can't imagine doing anything else yeah it's been that way for over 45 years and wow. he's still that's amazing uh, yep. leading us along and we, we keep seeing there's no top, there's no bottom to his, the well of his faithfulness. Mm, that's good. He is, continues to blow us away with how he provides. And uh, I mean, there's been through our married life, story after story of that there was no other way but yeah. God providing. Yeah, so good. God opening the door and making that opportunity happen. Almost embarrassing surprises, you know, just, <laughs> yeah. his generosity is just mm-hmm. yeah. out. Landish. I mean, it's it just is. lavish, and, and you're going, Lord, maybe somebody will see this. I don't know. <laughs> but I love those stories yeah. where it is it's obvious it's only God, so yeah. that you yeah, don't has to be. take the blame for it, you don't take the credit yeah. for it. It's totally the Lord. And we got hooked on that right after our marriage. I mean, it was that way in that environment, mm-hmm. or you didn't survive. Yeah. But um, that was a great foundation for us, and he knew he knew best. He knew best, but anyway, it's good. We we love being back together with Gina. <laughs> well, I am well, so 
grateful. It's such a beautiful that thing that the Lord has done, and I thank God for preserving you and building you and giving you such a great man. Yeah, me too. That loves you. <laughs> yeah. And you're both called, and you're, you're partners in things that wouldn't be possible if you didn't have both of you doing it. Well, thank you so much for being here. That's sweet of you. Thank you for it's being here. It's our pleasure. Here. Love you. Appreciate you. Would have been a real bummer. Boring <laughs> if you hadn't been here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, guys. We love you. Love you. God bless you and all that he's doing in and through you. Thank you, Lord. Vice versa. You know. Thank you. Oh, I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Terry and Nancy. And I really want to encourage you, go check out catalystpeople.com. You can find the link in the episode notes. That's their website. Terry has a podcast, Terry and Friends. And let me tell you, it's the who's who of Jesus Movement artist Kelly Willard, Tommy Coombs, Chuck Butler, um, Chuck Gerard, so many names, John Wickham. Go listen and check it out because these guys have, you know, they've walked it out. They've lived it for a lot of, lot of years. They've seen Jesus do a lot of things. They've been through a lot and they're, they're pillars in the faith. So go check them out. You can also find Terry's music going all the way back to some of the early, early albums like Let's Worship and Living Worship that were like literally the soundtrack to my life. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm so grateful, so grateful to have been able to spend this time with them. Hey, if you want to support the production of this podcast and other uh, projects from Stockton Ministries, you can make a tax deductible donation at the link in the episode notes, or you can visit us at our new website, StocktonMinistries.com, and click the donate button in the top right hand corner. Also, so excited to announce that Dwell is going to be released in April. It is coming. It's been a long journey, but I'm so excited to share with you these guided scripture meditations and prayer journal that I think are just going to be a resource for you to find that intimate, sacred space with Jesus. And last but not least, share this with your friends. Let people know. If you haven't already, would you please rate and review us in iTunes? All of it helps people to find us. And you, as I always say, are our best advertisement because we want people to be encouraged and find some hope. Have a great week. We'll see you next time in the sacred space.